Uh, I'm glad that I come back to uh, Kuching. Uh, Kuching is probably my, I would say, my another hometown. Uh, although I've been here only for five times, uh, but most of those trips in Kuching are very uh, uh, important in my life. I think my first intern uh, is in Kuching, uh, which is in 1995. I'm glad that uh, Mr. Chiu, uh, my boss, <laughs> uh, is here. Uh, we, we had met 1995, which is about 25 years ago. Yeah, 25 years ago. 25 years, yes. <laughs> oh, uh, and then at that time, I have as green as, uh, not even a green, I think a yellow <laughs> uh, architect. And I'm nervous about architecture. I do not know anything. And luckily, uh, Mr. Chiu with the team in Artimas Architects not scared me out from architecture. Um, I survived until today. I'm glad that I'm come back here. Uh, unfortunately, and fortunately, I think, uh, unfortunately, it's because of uh, my slides I prepared. Uh, in, in fact, I, I was so excited uh, when uh, we invite me to these uh, 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 occasions, and I had prepared quite, quite for quite some time. In fact, I have 300 over slides and two videos to share with you all. Uh, so the unfortunate. The unfortunate is that I'm not able to show all that, uh, but as an architect, we always see a uh, disaster as an opportunity. So I think today I have to make a very difficult uh, decision, uh, also challenge myself, see whether we can deliver all our thought without any picture reference. In fact, it's a disaster for an architect to go without image. And uh, today I'm so lucky that I have it and I'm forced to to experiment it. So you all are my uh, white elephant, uh, uh, white mice to ex experiment. So let's uh, uh, work together to make sure that the idea can, can uh, tr uh, transpire without any uh, image as a medium. Uh, we asked me to show, just glance through a bit of my uh, works of what is my architect's, uh, 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 my, my architect's journey is. So probably this will create some uh, uh, some reference for me to talk further. Uh, okay, this is this is about our office. Uh, our office set up in year 2003. So this is our 17 years. Um, in these 17 years, we have gone through a very roller coaster type of uh, journey. Uh, we have time that, in terms of profit making, we have time that we make profit. We have time that we didn't. We have time that we under pressure of end of the month, every end of the month, like now, uh, is our nightmare because we have to pay uh, our, our salary. Uh, we are also uh, have a good time where the time is booming. Uh, we may have quite sufficient of collections that we may enjoy a better uh, benefit with our colleague. So, uh, in fact, we had already accept the facts that Architect's life is not a straight line, uh, or if, even though architectural journey is not from point to point, but it's actually a zigzag journey without any destinations. And I think the interesting part is that the destination is always change. Uh, from year one, I may want to go to point A, but year two, my destination is point B, and so on and so forth. So I uh, so this is actually a never-ending process, and we call it a journey. Uh, this is about us. I just randomly picked some of the pages, and this is what our daily life is. We have uh, three three offices. Penang is our main office where we have about thirty-five people, uh, plus and minus. Uh, KK is our second office where we have about six to seven person now, and uh, we have another office in KL, uh, which we have about ten people there. And also uh, in Alostar, we have another another small office whereby we have around uh, less than ten person. So this is about us. Uh, to handle this, we have actually a few partners, and me and Liu and May M Liu is L, so it's called A L M, uh, are the founder. Uh, our idea is that uh, we create a platform for everyone to uh, to incubate their their, their architectural uh, career. 
So ALM is not only for us, I think it's for everyone. And it's not on, uh, necessarily uh, lead by us, it, it can lead by somebody else in future. So I will take that as a, as a platform. Uh, of course, as, an, uh, as every, I think we, we have a lot of uh, architecture students here. Uh, I think me, like you all, when I graduate, uh, I'm very ambitious. Uh, I hope that I can do whatever, uh, I, I can be an architect, a good architect as what I have learned from my school. At that time, those famous architects when we study, uh, of course, other than Norman Foster, those big names, we have Jah Hadid, we have uh, uh, Richard Mayer and all those names. So we hope that we can be part of them, we can be uh, as good as them. But unfortunately, uh, we, uh, the, the, the world out there is not as what we think of. Because those architects are actually on the tip of the pyramid. They are probably 0.01% of all of us. Just like Lee Chong Wei in badminton. I love, how to play, I love to play badminton, but I can never become a Lee Chong Wei. So what if, let's say, if I love to play badminton and I am not a Lee Chong Wei, what shall we do? And what we learn from the school is all about Lee Chong Wei. So we are disappointed. Of course, I think you will be disappointed as well. Uh, I, but I think that uh, the disappointment is a starting point of architecture journey. Then we start thinking about other than Jaha, other than Norman Foster, other than IMP, do we have any other uh, architectural options that we have? Of course, we have, we have no clue at that time because this is a long journey and architecture is something that uh, we find that we know a lot of things, but in fact, we know nothing about architecture. We know that the house should have three bedrooms, but we don't know how these three bedrooms will suit into every different individual lifestyles. We do not know anything, but we find that we know a lot of things. So I think this is very, very difficult uh, uh, situation for all of us to find uh, some clue in architecture. So this is about our office. Uh, okay, we have, we have uh, this is some of our jobs. So uh, our office started from, we call it a bread and butter job. We need to survive. Uh, so our first option is not architecture. Our first option is to make sure that at the end of the month, we have money to pay our staff. Uh, so uh, luckily, we, are, we, are, we have been survived 17 years. That means uh, we have passed that, uh, that hurdle. Uh, we are able to feed everyone. Uh, and so far, we never borrow any money from the bank. Uh, so we have passed that, but that is about just bread and butter. So, uh, of course, after 10 years of bread and butter, we have developed our office to a certain size that we have. In fact, we started just two person in the office. We pick up the phone, we do draftings, we do uh, very late until 12 o'clock at night. We come to office at 7.30 in the morning. If we need to go to authority, we go to authority. If nobody in the office, we just close, shut down our door. That's it. So from, from that, we had been developed within about, until 2009, we have a team of about 30 people. And that is already considered among one of the biggest in Penang. So in small town, that is the biggest firm that we can have. Uh, and at the same time, we, we start to get some recognitions. We won some award. For example, uh, we had been uh, fourth or fifth years, uh, had been selected as uh, BCI Top 10 Architects of Malaysia. I think we are proud to be together with one of the Sarawakian. I think Dato John Lau, he has been there every, every time I see him. So I hope this year I can see him again there. So this is one of the recognitions. Uh, and then uh, from there onwards, we, because in order to, to prove that we are good architects, we are, we are always keen to participate in competitions. We also won some of the competitions. For example, one of it is uh, our Para Road Market uh, competitions. We participate in this market competition because the market are so close to our office. It's just about one kilometer from our office and many of our colleagues, uh, parents or family members are working there or so eating there and we ourselves enjoy the food and buy the, the food from there as well. So that is some sort of like a project that we engage us directly. So we won a second prize of that and because of that, I don't, I don't know, somehow it linked us to uh, PAM and at that year was 2018. Uh, Ang was the uh, organizer of Datum. So he asked me, hey, do you want to speak in Datum? I said, wow, 
Yeah, definitely, I, I wish to. So that is where we have a chance to speak in datum uh, plus 2018. So uh, actually, uh, datum plus is something, datum is to add to, in fact, attend datum is our every year's uh, event. I think I meet many of you, even uh, we, uh, Mr. Chiu, we, uh, datum is the place that we gather every year. Uh, but of course, every year I sit down uh, as an audience and every year I have a crazy thinking of what if, let's say, uh, there's a day I have a chance to stand on the stage of Dayton stage, what I will speak to the audience. I think that is quite challenging because I, at, 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 uh, before that I have no confidence at all to my architecture. I find that my architecture is just a bread and butter architecture, it's just a surviving architecture. Do I have anything? good enough or proud enough to spend, uh, to, to occupy 20, 20 minutes to one hour of the audience time to speak there, what qualified me? So that actually uh, gives me a big challenge during 2018 when I have a chance to speak in, in uh, data. So uh, I decided at that time because uh, the time is only 20, 20 minutes. So I just focus on two of my projects. Uh, which is uh, Chia Kong Si and Gudang Cafe. Uh, so uh, after that, uh, I start to, uh, because that actually start off my thought of architecture. I start to organize my journey uh, of architecture and I start to curate, or I start to express what is my architecture is uh, as a bread and butter architect. So uh, actually those, uh, Heritage building restorations give me a good, uh, so-called, a good ingredient in my architectural journey. Uh, it gives me a lot of raw uh, impact. Like the building is stand there, it speaks to you. You doesn't need to go into a drawing board. You doesn't need to uh, go uh, Google it. You doesn't need to ask people. The drawing itself is already a teacher, so it gives you a direct impact to you. It, in fact, it gave me a big impact as before that I treat architecture as uh, as something very uh, uh, knowledge based. It's a knowledge based. When we uh, every time when we want to achieve uh, architectural solutions, we need to go from point A, point B, point C. We have a standard SOP. We need site analysis. We need to do conceptual design. We need to go to the the, the detailed design stage, and we ha we are actually operating like a factory and we have a standard SOP. So that's why our architectural solutions is pretty much uh, standard and is pretty much a uh, 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 so-called uh, 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 repetitive. So by, by, uh, in the experience of doing those uh, uh, heritage uh, conservations, I start to learn from the building and I start to dialogue directly to the building, to the craftsman itself, we are not able to do a conservation without a craftsman because they know more than us. We need to sit down there, squat there on the side, sweating with them and learn from them. Then only we can make a better decisions. My second project in conservation like, uh, is a Gudang Cafe. Uh, that is slightly a uh, different project. So uh, Gudang Cafe is actually, uh, I'm one of the co-owner co of the Gudang Cafe. And when architects is an owner, it will act differently because we will feel that our pocket will be painful with every single cent that we, we spend. Not like last time, uh, I can spend as much as my client's uh, 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 account. So in that case, we have to be a bit, a very much uh, cost conscious. We start to talk, think about, uh, think about uh, the profit, the ROI, and how we can sustain this business and how we can make money, the most importantly. Uh, and architectural uh, dream become a luxurious to us at that moment. So when I'm architect, when I'm when dealing with this situation, what shall I do? So uh, in fact, that is a very good opportunity because, because we have no money. If we have money, then we can do everything. Uh, then I, I will lose the opportunity to explore architecture. If because we have no money, then we have to think out of the box. So what we do is that in Penang, we have a lot of uh, waste. Uh, recycled material. People tear the old houses, they throw away all the materials. 
and all those are the resources that we salvage. So since we have to salvage a recycled material, we can't go to the supplier, go to Tesco, go to the, uh, 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 those uh, standard place to look at what is have, uh, we have on the shelf, but we have to look at the heritage area, at the uh, rubbish dumping site, what we have, what is the uh, rubbish that we can reuse. And we are quite lucky that we found one of the, one of the uh, old houses in uh, Scotland Road in Penang, which they are going to tear down to give way for a high-rise development. So uh, we are managed, we, from there we managed to salvage four uh, long trusts, which is about 45 feet long, and which fit just nice enough uh, thanks, <laughs> a nice photo, which fit nice enough in our cafe. And at the same time, we have a friend, he has a, he has a factory just burned, by, uh, burned down by fire. So uh, he loves coffee, so what we do is that uh, we do some butter trade. We give him, yeah, yeah this is a long table, we give him, we give him a, a free coffee machine. In return, we go and salvage whatever rubbish that he don't want. So that is the butter trade that we survive. And what we do is that uh, we are actually doing a reverse engineering. We go, we, we, we collect all the rubbish first and then we, we compose it or we curate it in an interesting way that uh, it reflects uh, how the best composition of the rubbish. So in this case, because I am the client myself, so I have a choice to determine, I, I doesn't need a proper contract documents. We squat on the site, use chalk to draw on the floor. We talk to the contractors. We don't have architectural drawing. And this is actually reverse engineering of architecture, which is op it gives me an opportunity, a good opportunity to, uh, to learn uh, how, to think, how to do things out of the box, how to create things uh, without using SketchUp, without using uh, a drawing board. And our idea is totally flow from the site. And even some of our idea is actually come from the side lane that we inspired just next to next to our 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 cafe. So uh, from there we learn, and it end up it end up the end result is very good. In, in fact, it's out of expectation. To me, this is just a business. Uh, architect cannot make money, so I want to have more income just in case. So this is just a business, but it end up the result is good. I myself surprised by the power of the old material, or by the power of the light, or even if I go there at night when the whole city are quiet, I switch on the music, I can feel the echo is very nice, uh, with a nice cup of coffee. So that uh, feeling actually give me a strong touch. Uh, so that's why subsequently I have another chance to give a sharing in Penang during 2018. Uh, World Architecture Day. So my topic at that time is the touch of architecture. Why I have, uh, uh, why the touch is so important to me because it gives me a very good sense or a very good starting point of how I can curate my uh, complicated architectural ideas or architectural solutions. So uh, at that time, I find that uh, architects has been in a very difficult position. All, all of us, all of us, uh, uh, when I'm new, I come out. Uh, actually, to me, architecture is very uncomfortable. This is where our today's topic is. Architecture is very uncomfortable. But slowly, when years goes on, when I when I build up my uh, experience, I know what the tricks. I know what the do and don'ts. And I have more uh, uh, resources. I start to develop my own SOP, and I think everybody does. And slowly we find that architecture is not that difficult. And slowly we find that it can be repetitive, it can be duplicate, it can be similar to yesterday. Uh, so of course, if it's similar to yesterday, then tomorrow will be the same as well. So that is the place where I find I, I start find architecture become more and more comfortable. So from there onwards, actually, go concurrently with our award of our top ten architects, and we have PAM, uh, three other spam awards. Uh, excuse, uh, sorry, I forgot to mention. So with all this award, I find that my journey become more and more comfortable. Then uh, the funny thing is that when I find more and more comfortable in my journey, 
I, and then at the same time, I find more and more uncomfortable. In fact, I, will, I, I call it uncomfortably comfortable because you will feel scared why the life is so simple and why there's no more challenge to push me and uh, why I'm always at the uh, comfortable positions uh, in my journey or in my life. So at that time, uh, I start to uh, think of put myself in, in another uh, challenge again. So I don't know why uh, my journey to architecture uh, doesn't, con uh, doesn't, doesn't continue in architecture way, but at that time, I start to pick up sports. Yeah, sports, S-P-O-R-T. Uh, why sports? Uh, I, I don't know. It's just a, urge, a strong urge that uh, I start to involve in running, starting from 10 kilometers and slowly 21K. Uh, yeah, we mentioned that at that time they go to Penang. That is the time that we are start talking about not only architecture, but about, I think half, half, half of our conversation is about midlife crisis, <laughs> yeah, about running. Uh, because at that time, I'm running 21K uh, half marathon. And slowly, I find that 21K is not, not enough. Then, of course, we slowly upgrade to a marathon. And as a marathoner, then we find that what's next? I don't know why. I, I can't tell why, but the urge is just push me towards that direction. So, yeah, that is midlife crisis. And uh, not only mentioned by uh, uh, we, and in fact, there's another of my friends. He also has, uh, he's, he's uh, Ng Xiao Kong. I think he's uh, he's an ultra marathoner. He also he also shared the same idea with me. So I buy this idea of midlife crisis, and uh, uh, I think I I'm, I'm lucky that I explore my architecture. So I I did do a bit to sports, and from sports I learned uh, how to face uncomfortable situations, uh, uh, and how to make uncomfortable comfortable again. So because to me, uh, we always want to stay in comfort zone. That is, that is very normal, everyone, because if you look at animal, if you look at even the dogs, under the hot sun, he will automatically go to the shade, human as well. So, but what if, let's say, every time when there is a hot sun, and we just go to the shade, and of course, every time we are so lucky, we have a shade there, like we are not the desert. But do we have another way, another way to handle this uncomfortable? So my, my thought is actually, actually, if you want to make uh, uncomfortable, uh, what if, let's say, we make the uncomfortable comfort, comfortable? That means we can, can we extend our comfort zone? Yes, it can. Uh, actually, my experience in, in running a marathon, and uh, yeah, after, after my, my marathon, actually, I go for Ironman. Um, Ironman is a tri triathlon. We need to swim, bike, and run. Uh, it's not easy to do a, f a full Ironman, which we have to uh, swim 3.8 kilometers, cycle 180 kilometers, then only you run a marathon of 20, uh, 42 kilometers. So it needs a long training, it needs a lot of uh, uh, that determinations and lead, uh, need a lot of consistent training. We almost need to train 20 hours a week, uh, weekend. Uh, weekday we work for eight hours. Weekend we train for eight hours for both Saturday and Sunday. And every morning I have to wake up, start training at five o'clock in the morning. And we have another afternoon sessions after I rush back from work. I have to train another one 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 hour. So that is the amount of training that we need to do. And I start to ask myself why, why I want to do that. Does it benefit to me? Am I spend too much time, or might as well spend more time in the office to make more money? But I don't know why the urge is start just like very strong and pushing me to that direction. And all this actually helped me to learn one, one thing, just one thing, is those previously uncomfortable, uncomfortable to me become a comfort zone to me. Like previously, I, I normally back to my hometown, Alostar, by driving. By now, I enjoy to cycle back my hometown, which is about 100 kilometers which I enjoy the journey. So those previously is a torture to me. I even feel that I'm uncomfortable even I'm driving because I have to drive one hour to, to back to my hometown. But now I enjoy the journey, cycle under the hot sun of three to four hours back to my hometown. So that is a big change to me that I can change 
those uncomfortable to a comfortable zone. That means I extend my boundary of my, con um, of my comfortable to into the, uh, uh, encroach into my previously uncomfortable zone. So now I can stand under the hot sun. I have no problem to cycle under the hot sun for eight hours. I enjoy it like a sauna. So I think this is my gain. Uh, rather than we keep on put ourselves in comfortable uh, in comfort zone, then our comfortable our comfort zone boundary will be actually shrink, shrinking and shrinking and shrinking. And now we have to stay 24 hours in the aircon room. So that is what I learned from there. And how does this help me in architecture? And I think architecture is a long journey. We need endurance as well. Uh, I not only learn uh, about comfortably uncomfortable. But I learned another thing about architecture from my sport is slowly fast. I think uh, those who are running marathon can, can agree with me that you need to run slow in order to run fast. Because we need to pace ourselves, we need to uh, distribute our energy throughout a long distance and end up the result is fast because you will go into a slow and steady pace and that's the best pace for, for, for ourselves. This will apply in architecture. Every, every one of us have our own rhythm, our own biological clocks that is suited to us. So we don't need to compete ourselves. Yeah, during the Ironman, during the uh, 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 marathon, we never compete with our competitor. In fact, we run together, we cheer together, we, we enjoy the journey together. I think this is what, uh, uh, this, is, this is something very good to me. I, I enjoy this because after I do this, I, I won't compete with my other uh, architect's friends. We make friends with them, we cheer each other, we work together as a team, and we face this, uh, this uh, 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 imperfect world uh, together. So I find that that is another opportunity for me. Okay, so from sports, after the sports, I, I get some energy back to architecture. So I come back to architecture. Uh, before I come back to architecture, Unfortunately, I detour again to another side of the world before, before back to my architecture. What is the other side of the world? Uh, the other side of the world is actually sketching. Uh, I start to pick up, of course, every, every architect sketch, but we only sketch on the drawing board. But uh, three, four years ago, I think, for three, four years ago, I pick up uh, urban sketching, uh, which is quite interesting to me that I can sketch. I need to. I, I start to sketch in front, uh, 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 in uh, plain air, outside, direct to, to the objects. Then we do it. We start doing in doing it work weekly, and end up the first year. I found that I have done 300 sketches in a year. If you average it out, it's about one sketch a week, uh, one sketch a day. Uh, what is my gain during uh, sketching? Because uh, as an architect, we always like to do photograph. We need to. We, we like to compile a lot of uh, informations, but those information are too many. It don't have any sensors. It's just information. It's just a digital file in the computer. You may have one thousand photo uh, when you do a site visit, but you can't remember. You can't have any feeling to this photo because that is only taken by your digital camera or your handphone. But sketching is different. Uh, to do a sketch, at least you need to sit there, observe the thing interpret it uh, in your own way and actually the interpretation is not so much on the paper but it's very much actually in your mind. Uh, even though I sketch 300 sketches a year, so if I have four years sketching experience, I should have sketched 1,002 sketches. But if you show any sketches to me in front, if I pick up any sketches in front of me, I can tell you the story behind. Uh, this is one of my this one of my sketch. So you can imagine I have one thousand two hundred of this uh, sketch. So uh, each sketch of this is actually uh, a journey of architecture. It's a record of my life. Uh, you may find familiar. Yes, yeah, this is somewhere in Kuching, uh, in Siniawang, where I love the place very much. Uh, I did it three years ago. I, can, I still can remember when I did it, whom I did it with, and what I eat before and after that. You can see a coffee stain at the lower right-hand corner. That is the coffee that I drink, and I put it in my sketch. You can see the brown color here. The brown color is actually, I don't use my color, I use a coffee. 
So that is all the real, if you smell it, that is, that is the smell that you can have. And I, I still remember that I did it three years ago when I participated in the uh, Asia Link sketch walk in Kuching, where at that time we have uh, about four five hundreds of sketches all over Asia gather in Kuching. Then I did uh, I, I didn't follow the program that day. This is not the program because I have been uh, told that there is one interesting uh, village called Sinyawang that I need to explore, and all the houses are built by billion is still there and now they are revitalizing it and it's vibrant so I just go there and do it in that beautiful afternoon. So this is one of my experience times 1,200. So once it's, yeah, actually I bring this is because I want to give it to uh, Pam uh, Sarawak chapter uh, to appreciate. <laughs> so uh, I think a little later. <laughs> okay, and in fact, the, the story is interesting. The interesting story is not the physical drawing that I did. In fact, I did it together with a few Chinese sketches at that time from Dongguan, uh, China. Uh, and after I did it, I think I did may, I think maybe 10 or 12 of the sketches in Kuching at that time. So what I decide is that, thank you. I decide not to, bring, because normally I, I, I just bring back all my drawing. So I suddenly, something come up from my mind that I decided not to bring back any of this drawing. At that time, I, I used Mandarin. Lah. I said, Put tai zhou yi yun chai. We don't bring out a single cloud from uh, Kuching. So what I draw in Kuching, I leave it in Kuching. Fortunately, I have a brother staying here. So I just leave it in his house. Then we go and frame it out without knowing what are we going to do with that. But I just believe that one day, the drawing may find uh, all this drawing. Lah. All these drawings are my babies. I have 1,200 babies may find a good place uh, to settle down in Kuching. So I think this drawing have one of the interesting journey that he may, he may find a place, a nice place to uh, settle down in uh, Pam Sarawak chapter. Uh, so every one of these we've had with a story and all this story will add into my architectural ingredient. I even have one of the market competition, during one of the market competitions, normally what we do is that we do, we do interview. We interview people. Uh, Uncle, auntie, what do you think if I build a market here? So wh whatever they answer you is not true. Uh, because that is an interview. So what I do is that I just go there and do sketching. When I'm sketching, I sit down in a coffee shop. People come and talk to me already. So when people come and talk to me, we start conversation very casually and slowly. We ask him a, a lot more. Or I just sit at the, quietly at the coffee shop. I listen to other people's conversations. Like an auntie, he talked to another uh, 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 hawker there. He said, hey, Abeng, uh, uh, yesterday uh, my son buy me a handphone. I don't know how to use. Uh, can you teach me how to use? Then Abeng said, oh, yeah, yeah, no problem. Uh, by the way, you know, uh, yesterday uh, uh, this Ali uh, knocked down by a car on the road. Uh. Then it, we, from, from there, we know the conversation, the problem of the people, and we know more about the, uh, the, uh, the, 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 the real information about the residents. So I think that is another way of, uh, of, of, uh, of uh, doing architecture interview. So, uh, so the touch, the touch element, uh, actually I start to gain from there. And of course, uh, during these uh, sketchings, I learned another thing, which is very useful in architecture. Uh, we have been, we have been teach in the school that to use a very logical way to think about architecture. We do analysis, A, B, C, D, E. Then we do conceptual design, bubble diagram. Then we do a space programming and uh, we blah, blah, blah. We, we come up with a space design. I will tell you, if you follow this, uh, we, we won't be able to think out of the box. But by doing sketches, we need to do uh, decisions. Every stroke are decisions, every color, every every uh, composition are a decision. We need to do a fast decision without much thinking. And this actually helped me to, uh, to, uh, to change the way that I do architecture. So instead, after I do sketching, uh, my architecture actually go more uh, spontaneous and more uh, surprised because sometimes I can think about the result first. Then I come back to look at the process. And maybe sometimes one result cannot, then I have to think of 10 results. Or it may not do so. It, 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 
it, it may not go necessarily like, like this. It may go midway first. So it doesn't need to go in a straight line, but it's actually a very random way of uh, uh, solution searching. So this helps us to actually uh, break out of the box and we can come up with a different uh, solutions every time. And why we need to go out of the box? Uh, I, have, I have actually think about this, especially recently. Why I need to go out of the box? Because when I go out of the box, actually a lot of my audience, my audience means my, my client and user, may find uncomfortable. Uh, recently, just a week ago, I experienced this. I feel very sad, upset to architecture. Uh, I, have, I have my school, my primary school, asked me to go back and do uh, contribution to them, to design a new school to them. I'm so happy. Then I come up with uh, a very different shape of architecture. Because I, I have a bad experience during my school day. Uh, my, of course, my school is similar to other school that we have a long corridor, straight line, square building, courtyard, everything are the same. Uh, we never have any surprise when you go to school. We don't have any options how to arrange our tables and chairs. But I just want to think of if I can give our new generations a, a, a interesting school, uh, then they can mix around with a uh, like a village. They can make friends. They can have more interesting way of interact with each other. Uh, teachers have more creative way to teach students, more diverse way of interacting with the students. Why not? So I come up with the idea of hexagon uh, classroom because I find that hexagon is something that the most efficient uh, uh, structures in the world where bees are good using it, the nature are actually using it. So uh, I find that that is good solutions to me uh, and to the future generation. I, and it may probably reduce the cost because of the efficiency of the structure. So I am happily propose this. Uh, end up, actually, of course, the client, the school board, accept this at the first place. But the things will go very differently. The things will go very differently is when, uh, when they start one to kickstart the project. Uh, they start have noises, different noises, and people start to curry. And once they start curry, uh, they start to uh, feel uncomfortable to accept the new idea. And we have, now it's still ongoing, we have a big debate on this, and I, of course, I want to defend my idea, and they don't want, end up, they, they might want to get another option, so get another architect to come in to, 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 to provide them what they want, and we are in the midst of that fight thing. So, I am thinking of, why we should make our audience so uncomfortable as an architect. Because sometimes I feel very sad because they will, my, my, my client feel like support me, uh, say good to me every time. Oh, May, you are so good. Thank you to have you here. But when I'm not there, they start complaining about me. These architects uh, always give us problem. They give us a difficult design. They give us a lot of problem. So I, some, sometimes I feel very bad on that. Then I, as an architect, we should have actually let people live happily and not let our client live in a very miserable way. But I am the one who let a lot of people live in a very miserable way because I try to, I try to, try to push the things beyond the boundary. And once the, once the thing is not the norm of everybody, then people start worry. And of course, when we want to make uh, innovative ideas successful, it must have a lot of hurdle. And a lot of, uh, man, in many occasions, we will stop at the first hurdle. And it might have hundreds of these hurdles and uh, before we can push through all the way. So uh, to me, my thinking of innovations is, uh, of course, we have a lot of norm. We have a lot of do and don'ts in the architecture. If we follow this, there's nothing wrong. I, I can earn a good living. Uh, I can go, go for my sports and sketching. I'm happy enough. But it doesn't make our world progress because the norm is not always a good idea. So that's why sometimes as a naughty architect like us, we want to push the thing to the limit. So that is what we do and we are willing to face it. Unfortunately, the process of pushing this doesn't help us to make more money, but in fact, it reduces our profit because sometimes we need to spend more time on something. Uh, so Sometimes when it comes to a reality, when you come to the end of the month, whether your balance sheet is there, is, is good or not, healthy or not, then we might think uh, very deeply on this in, in the mid of the night. 
So that is the uh, interesting part of architecture. I think, uh, so we come back to the touch. So by sketching, it gave me a lot of uh, 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 feeling, a lot of sentiments that I may, uh, I may be using this in my, in my architecture. So from there onwards, uh, I start to uh, curate my own architectural story and start to push things to the limit. So that is where uh, we, we, we actually uh, start our, our journey is uh, maybe, so this is, okay, if you look at this randomly, this is one of our, we call it bread and butters, it's a high-rise condominium. Uh, if you go to Penang, it will come from, a high, uh, come from a, uh, the, the airport to Georgetown. This will probably be the first uh, high-rise building that you can see along the coastal highway. That uh, the client gives us a very limited, uh, a very limited uh, resources. Where he is a very Chinaman client, he don't have any uh, extra budget even for the coping. So what we do is that since we don't have that, I think can, can we go back to the previous one? Since we, since, we, since we don't have any budget, so what I do is that I just play with the window. Left and right, left, left and right, left and right. So create a very random type of facade. Uh, at least it doesn't look so. Uh, it it, it becomes a texture rather than uh, just a facade decorative element. So on the other hand, the next one. Uh, uh, yeah. Okay. So I think we just go randomly. This is the next. This is this is a project that we did. It we start the design on year two thousand six, but it completed at year two thousand one four. It takes a long time. Uh, you can see a link bridge there. Uh, that is a link bridge that uh, that we sell very hard. Uh, it costs a Lamborghini. Uh, the cost of link bridge is about three million, not a Lamborghini, or maybe four Lamborghini. So the the client is Taiwanese client. He is very cost conscious. He said, no, 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 no. I am not going to spend this because this is my profit. So of course, at, at the end of the day, he still stand there because uh, we managed to convince them. The, uh, normally, as an architect, we, we want to convince our client in an architectural way, but I find that this doesn't work. So what I do is that I talk money to my client. We have 425 units there. If the link bridge can make your house uh, 20,000 uh, uh, a higher value than without, then you may make 8 million there and you only spend 3 million, so you still make extra 5 million. So he said, yes, go ahead. Then this is what we have here. So sometimes architecture is something, a negotiation process with our client, and we are proud because the link bridge is in Butterworth. The direction is actually directly uh, uh, towards uh, uh, the city centre of Georgetown, and it casts a very nice backdrop of sunset. So that is actually one of the best sunset viewpoint in the whole Penang. So it, 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 it some, sometimes we have to push the limits and we have to convince our client in a very non-architectural way. So we just go randomly of what if our, is our uh, other's architectural. Uh, uh, this is another uh, project that uh, we also uh, uh, playing in terms of uh, composition of windows uh, within a very limited budget. Uh, okay, then, uh, yeah, this is the one. Can we, I think, can we click further in on, on this? You said randomly, right? Randomly, uh. okay, uh, random, uh. Yeah. okay, okay. I, I think the, the lower lower right hand side, lower right hand side is a is a building that we win a uh, silver medal. Uh, we was awarded silver medal in the in the I think the previous one silver medal in in the PAM award two years ago. That was a that was a council building, and normally a council building. We have a very prototype governmental uh, image, which is symmetrical, grand, and something like that. But uh, because of the setting of that building is actually inside, not this one, I think. Uh, <laughs> Let's go back. Ah, this one. Yeah, because this building is actually setting in a forest. So what we do is that we, instead of a big building, we create some sort of a container looks a building scattered around a, a central spine, which is open, open air, and those central spines connected become part of the park of the, uh, of the, uh, of the landscape. So uh, coincidentally, the, the building uh, is, is actually occupied by the uh, landscape departments of, uh, of MP, 
MBPP. So they are happy with, with, with that. Uh, and we are quite lucky that uh, the design of this building is to make the building, the government office, transparent. We suggest that we don't need to have any fence wall. We, doesn't, we allow people to walk in even after office hour, make the building as a park. And it happened until today. Uh, the clients are there enough and trust our public enough that they don't put up any grill and all the glasses. You can just look, look into it and, pe and public actually can walk just outside uh, the office. And the aircon usage is very much reduced because uh, we don't aircon the corridor, only the office area are aircon. And because of building are smaller, so they don't, they don't even need to switch on the light during the daytime. The natural light is good enough. Uh, to shine to, uh, to, uh, for, for their works. And also because the surroundings are surrounded by all the greeneries, they don't even need to put out a curtain because uh, the curtain will block their view. So there's no curtain, no grill, there's directly transparency to the public and the corridor has become part of the uh, forest park. So you just walk on the corridor unknowingly with all the slanting columns, um, unknowingly those columns will turn into a trees and you are like walk, just walking in the forest. So that is the uh, innovative that we try to uh, we try to uh, put in our architecture. So uh, from from there we start to gain some uh, reputations and people come to us. Uh, of course, at the same time we're still doing on bread and butter. So uh, fortunately, uh, by end of last year, uh, there is one. Uh, good opportunity to us uh, where you know Penang, Penang are small island. Then Penang, all the while there had been uh, reclamations. So uh, Penang has a government has an ambitious plan of reclaim three uh, islands uh, at the southern part of Penang. So uh, we are one of the participants uh, who submit our portfolio for for government to uh, approve. So at that time. The first round, there is there was 127 participants participate in this, uh, and of course we was one of the 127. And the first round we was kicked off. Then the second short list is 27 numbers. Uh, then at that time we team up with one of the uh, famous uh, architect in Netherlands, uh, Emery R. D. V. Uh, then fortunately uh, we. Our team are shortlisted as one of the five uh, finalists. And to me, this is very difficult deci decision to uh, participate in these uh, competitions. As you know, the South Island, we call it Penang South Island uh, Reclamations. So Penang South Island Reclamation is a very controversial project in Penang. Uh, of course, all of us like Penang. We don't want uh, the beautiful, natural, or authentic Penang to be spoiled by those uh, mega developments. So many of us, including me, are one of, and even many architects are actually one of the person who object this project. But on the other hand, the opportunity come in, come in front of me where I have a chance to uh, work together with the world-renowned architects. And do I want to take up this opportunity where something which is I'm all the while against, because I love Penang. I cycle, I, I cycle around Island Penang, I run in Penang Hill, I, I, I hope Penang will forever in, in, in such a perfect conditions, but I, I don't want Penang to develop. So when this opportunity come, come to me, I ask myself, do I want to participate if this is against me? And in fact, at that time, I ask myself, am I really against it or against it before, uh, just because I don't really think deep about that. So I forced myself to really study about the necessity of doing these reclamations. Of course, we all of us know that the political agenda behind, be, behind that, what is, and then uh, we also know that the commercial behind that, uh, that is actually for sure. And we also agreed, of course, to the environment, protect the nature, protect the animals, uh, the benefit of fishermen, uh, and also the authentic uh, of the Georgetowns, all, all of them we, we, we agreed. But do we only have choice A and B? A or B? You choose A, you, will get, you won't get B, or you choose B, the Penang will forever don't be developed. Because, if you, if, because to a lot of people, to me also the same, I find that if Penang develop, 
we will lose the authentic Penang, we will lose the nature of Penang. On the other hand, for, for those people who love Penang, if, if Penang, uh, who, for those, those people who, who, who want to progress, uh, if we want to keep Penang as, as authentic as it is, then we will lose the opportunity to grow. So we start thinking of, can we, can we through a good planning, can we get both sides of the coin? So this is what we actually uh, discussed. And last two weeks ago, I was in Rotterdam. Then we have a chance to uh, really brainstorm on this project. In fact, the first thing in the agenda is, do we really want to take up this project, even though we have been one of the finalists? So do we want to take up this project? I, of course, uh, at, at the end of the day, yes. Uh, so we come up with the idea of, uh, in fact, the we come up with the idea of the development will save nature, the development will save the uh, heritage, because uh, whether, whether we like it or not, development is actually part of nature. All the city grows, none of the city in the world are not growing. Uh, so all the city grows, all the states are growing. So when we grow, can we grow in a way that we can keep nature and can we keep the heritage? So our idea is that we need to focus all the growth in in certain area so that we can release those uh, uh, the, the, the old Penang area from the re, from the development pressure at least for the next 20 or 30 years. So our idea of islands, safe island come up from there. So uh, I'm happy I'm, I'm happy because the whole team are Masale, the whole team are actually foreigner. Uh, they have their do and don'ts, they know their ways, but uh, as, a, as a local partner, we are able to contribute our local thought, our local concern, because I tell them, I tell them, uh, to you all, there's no problem for you all to make a mistake, because the worst is you don't come back to Penang for the, life of your, for the rest of your life. But it's not for me, because I'm staying in Penang for the rest of my life. I can't make this mistake. So please help me uh, to live happily for the rest of my life. So that is my statement, and I'm happy that uh, we, they, they are able to digest this, and we are progress very positively towards these directions. And uh, I can't say more about that because it's still uh, confidential. And I'm looking forward to uh, what is our team's uh, solutions. And I hope, uh, I think you all can look forward. And I think there will be a presentations. Uh, our team, I think uh, the founder of MVRDV, Vinimas, will come to Penang on May, early May, to, to, to have his presentations. And I'm looking forward to that and see how is the solutions. So I think that is interesting because as an architect, normally we have a full control on this. But now, I playing a role as a local architect. I don't have full control, but I can still contribute. I can still uh, influence, even though Regardless, they are renowned or not. I, I think we still have a have a have a good share to contribute to this uh, uh, to this uh, uh, architectural uh, attempt. So uh, I think I would like to uh, some sort. This actually today I have no prepared. I think it's blessed. I have never have this experience of talking in this type of very spontaneous. And I find at, at first I thought I'm nervous. Uh, but I find that I've, I speak quite comfortably, although I don't speak a good English, but I think this is what I think. I think there's a reason why Pecha Kucha was invented, because they wanted to limit architecture speakers to four, 20, <laughs> 20 slides and 20 seconds per slide. Because I think if we give him the mic for the next half an hour, he will continue talking about <laughs> some aspect of his life, which is very interesting. But I thought maybe we can just put a stop and see whether there are any questions from the floor that you'd like to ask, since this is more like a dialogue, for example. So I thought maybe I'll maybe set the scene, right? It, for, for the students especially, it seems as though if I can summarize it in one sentence, what he was talking about in quite detail. No, no, it's not midlife crisis. It's about how perhaps as a practitioner and as an architect, you shouldn't be comfortable because I think comfort breeds complacency. So if you are comfortable, you can cruise. Lah. But if you cruise, then you don't perform. And if you don't perform, then your projects wouldn't have that edge that separates you from the done line line, you know? Does it? Yeah. Is it right? Yes. Yeah. Okay. So, so on that note, would anyone like to ask questions? Maybe starting with Mr. Chu, since you are his earliest mentor. Do you have? It? Just shout it out, and um, he will. Yeah. 
Yeah, uh, first of all, I think I, I will thank Mr. Chiu for uh, not scared me from architecture. <laughs> no, I'm, I'm, I'm glad that I've not frightened you away. Okay. You know, but, but what, I want, what I wanted to ask you, you know, I mean, um, from your own experience, you know, uh, uh, being an architect now, you know, looking at all the young people here now, you know, the perception of architecture from the young people, um, I, I don't know what is their perception, you know, of architecture today, you know, uh, it's so different, you know, but what, what kind of advice, you know, I like, I like the, the part about you, you know, uh, sketching things, because I would tell my people, you know, the, the young people in the office, never, never give up the pencil and the butter paper. Always have your you know, your scale rule and your and your uh, pencil and butter paper you know next to you, because when you, I always tell them that I'll sketch ten lines, and you on your computer you only you know, manage to click to draw one straight line, but I've done ten different shape lines, you know, and that's how much, you know, like what uh, uh, Mr. May said that you know the sketching thing, the touching thing, it gives you. You know, it forces you to think. It forces you to make a decision on, on what, what you do. So that's why, you know, when you do, you, when you click on your computer, it is always a straight line, all right? It's either pointing north or pointing south. That doesn't matter, but it's still a straight line. But when you sketch, you know, it could be a curve, it could be a round, it could be a twisted line. But every time you do that, you're thinking. You're trying to find a solution. Yeah, and I think that is so important, you know. So, May, Mr. May, what would be your advice for young people, aspiring architects today? Oh, these are heavy questions. I think let us uh, summarize it in a very uh, simple way. I think two words: digital and analog. Uh, we are actually we are living in a virtual world. Everything goes digital. What is digi behind digital? Now, actually, we can see nice photo from the screen, but actually, behind digital is one and zero. All these possibility are how beautiful the photo are is actually determined by whom? Not by the scene, but by the programmer. How they program it and what you... It's not what you see and what you get. It's actually what you program and what you see. So, in fact, I have... Talking about sketching, I have experience of sketching by using iPad. Now, iPad, you can use Procreate to do a sketch. I, I really try that, I, but I, can't, I, I just can't do that because my creativity are limited by the creativity of the programmer. How much he anticipate the creativity are, I am stuck there because I cannot, cannot go beyond that. But if you go analog, if you go analog, it's not like one and zero. It can be very thousand because one stroke, uh, you can't put a, a very sentimental stroke in, uh, in, in iPad. It won't but you can do it in pencil because how the pencil respond to the paper, the type of paper you use, the, the stroke uh, and the feeling at that time all tells the story. So that's why actually a painting can tell the feeling of a paper, but computer cannot. If you sketch up, it won't be able to do that. So I think that is the touching element that it helps. And just now before the event, I have a good chat with Mr. Chiu that we're talking about ret retirement. I think uh, all of us agree. I, the first day I became an architect is the time that I start count down to my retirement date. I said I want to retire at my year 50. If, 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 I, if I say that, I have only one and a half year in my career. Uh, of course, it doesn't go that way. Uh, I have already given up to, to count down my retirement because uh, I think I agree with Mr. Chiu. I think probably every, uh, many architects that my retirement will be the last day of my life. Because at the end of the day, if I feel like I love architecture, in fact, architecture is something that I can fall in love. Now I already confused because sometimes I, when I wake up in the morning, I can automatically just pick up my, my, my pencil because I have a choice like today, Saturday morning, I will normally go cycling. But some, somehow I can't, just can't help to pick up my pencil to, 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 to think about architecture, to work on it. To work on it, but somehow to work on it means to play with to play with all the possibility, and that is not something that the job is not rushed and it's not even initiated by anyone. Sometimes I just want to do it for the sake of doing it. So you can be addicted. Architecture can be addicted if you go to that extent. Then I will say congratulations to you. Uh, architecture become your hobby. 
then retirement is not an issue. Or probably you want to retire, then you will turn architecture as your hobby. So then that is the best time. But uh, for those young people, you need to strike a balance. To me, if I, after I take architecture as my hobby, I find that my income will be less. <laughs> but I'm happy, I'm happy with that because why we need to have so much of money? What for we need to have so much of money? The, the purpose of money is to buy happiness. But if you can get happiness directly from architecture, we, do, we doesn't need to convert it from the ringgit, from, from the hard work to the ringgit and from the ringgit to the happiness. And in between, there is a lot of uncertainty. So I think I'm happy that uh, we've many of us fall in love in architecture and we find that that is the purpose of life. And I think I should have passed the mic back to V. If not, I will talk another half an hour. Yeah, it's the pecha kucha problem. Um, any other questions from anyone? Students? Yes. Thank you. <coughs> I'm not an architect, but I, I think what you, your, your presentation was great, a very great advocacy for architects to move out into uncharted territories. And uh, one of these territories is conservation architecture, which, which you've been working in. And I hope there's, I think Malaysia doesn't have enough real conservation architects, and I hope there's going to be more very soon. I'm speaking here as a member of the Sarawak Heritage Society. Um, now, my question is, uh, when you did the, the Kongsi project in Penang, you had to follow the rules and guidelines and regulations that are applicable in Penang because of the UNESCO site. And Penang is probably one of the, has probably one of the most detailed conservation regulations and guidelines in, in, in Malaysia. So what, what, if you had to say something about these regulations, what, what would you say as, as from your experience on that project and other conservation projects in, in Penang? Yeah, can I have another two hours to talk about this? <laughs> okay, I think this is interesting questions and I'm sick on this. Uh, I will say, in general, I think uh, it's blessing that Penang has been listed as World uh, a UNESCO Heritage Site. It has been, been changed Penang a lot, but as my experience grown up in Penang, in fact, I love uh, the old days of Penang more than today. And we start discuss about what the point that we need to make Penang so uh, famous and then flooded with all the tourists and those are old shops, old, uh, uh, old, uh, old uh, jobs, old businesses all disappeared and replaced with all brand new cafe, boutique, hotel that it doesn't relate to my childhood experience in Penang. Where my childhood experience in Penang is that I go to Penang, there is a becha, slow cycling and people are working uh, those, 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 those are lively, and there's, uh, then I, today I go to Penang, we have, we have a lot of tourists, packed with tourists, all the cafe look the same, I'm one of, that, one, one of the owners who, who, who contribute to this, and it lost all the uh, authentic, that day I go to, uh, with me to Tochun, that is one of the alley, small alley that where is all the cafe, all, all the real local food come from, so I lost all that. I'm thinking of, I, I don't have an answer. I still need to look for the answer because we are in the, we are, in, in one hand, we, we find that we are over-regulated. Like for example, uh, actually I have two, two thoughts about conservation. Uh, in fact, I share this during the day term. One is the, the conservation uh, uh, preferred from the authority is time freezing. They want to freeze the building at 1960s, 18, 1890s, so they want to put make Penang as a museum of all the architecture, where I agree, I agree with it. But on the other hand, I think architecture needs some dynamics. Uh, architecture needs some variety. Archite architectures need some uh, conversations, need old and new. It's not only all the old architectures. Uh, if you can imagine today, I go to Italy, I can see only all the uh, 
all the uh, medieval architectures, it is boring because uh, because after hundred uh, a few hundred years, I saw that in any old town in Europe, they have actually mixed era. They have they have they have they have medieval, they have Rome, they have Renaissance, they have many other Baroque architectures or even modern architectures standing side by side. They are they are, they, are, they are living happily or they are quarrelling happily within each other. Uh, I love the way IMP put the pyramid in the middle of the loaf and create a lot of controversial. I think that becomes something interesting and something to contradict about. So is the is the conservation in Penang should be a time freezing or my another idea in my Gudang Cafe is well, I call it timescaping. If we have landscaping, why not we do it a, a timescaping? We make the timescape appear, we keep all the uh, profile of the history, all the record, instead of washing up, because our conservation is wash up the wall, scrap it up, redo the plastering, that actually lost all the touch to me, all the feeling. In my Gudang Cafe, we keep all the painting, but unfortunately, the contractor accidentally painted one wall. And we, we are so sick of, of it, we scold the contractor and we want him to paint back to the original uh, situations. Then, of course, we can't. And end up, we hire an artist to, to mimic the wall next to it. And we pay 1,200 ringgit for the artist to paint it back. And now, if the next round you come to Gudang, I show you, you may be able to recognize which is the one painted back by artists. Because even though you are so skillful, you won't be able to imitate the, 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 the footprint of the time. So I call that as a timescaping. So do we want our city become a time-freezing museum or a timescaping, vibrant, growing, dynamic type of conservation? I would like to name it another name. I call it dynamic conservations, something like that. Or we can continue. I have no, I have no answer on that. Are there any more questions? Maybe just to elaborate while you guys think of a question for Mr. May. Um, I think uh, talking about heritage, right, I think there are three aspects to it. There is conservation, there is preservation, and then there is restoration. But in not so developed countries like ours, I think our buildings need to have another form of uh, conservation, which is adaptive reuse. Because if you don't have adaptive reuse, the building is unable to earn its keep. It doesn't have a function in its contemporary sense, which means that the government still has to find money to continue to either preserve or conserve it. But if you give it something that earns its keep, right? then it, earns, it, it has a new role, whether it's a library or a restaurant or something that enables it to retain its original character while earning enough money to then upkeep that character, then that makes sense. So the public must have access to these buildings in order for adaptive reuse to work. So you preserve and then you keep it for something, as something very nice for you to look at. I think that idea would fail unless your government has lots of funds for you to continue to do that. that that's my understanding of what a proper conservation of heritage um, should, that's how I think it should take, take um, its, its idea, the lessons from. Any other questions from the floor? If not, um, then I think we call this the, call, call an end to this um, uh, public lecture series. This will be the last one for this term. Uh, a new term of uh, committee members will be elected in uh, to office in another month. Okay, um, and in the in the future uh, public lecture series, we are hoping to work with uh, Unimas, uh, as I mentioned earlier. Um, you guys know who this man is now. So those of you who are a little bit shy, don't know how to ask questions in a pub public situation, I'm sure you can talk to him. Yeah, he's he's um, he doesn't he's very friendly. <laughs> um, and and, um, and he, he'll, he'll talk to you guys about any questions that you, you, you may have. So can we please um, thank Architect May